in the, in the break. Um, on finite, uh, so this is a, a blend of um, the finite dimension proofs so of a finite dimension equals so obviously has the same result. Uh, you don't need to ask for the regularity. And the, um, so in finite dimensions, it basically goes like this. Uh, because of the usual ODE solution theory, you know that locally integral curves exist. The question is, of course, can you continue them for all time? And uh, this will be sort of one part of the proof to show that if we have uh, an integral curve existing for some time interval, that we can continue this different uh, this integral curve for all time. And this is, in principle, the classical finite dimensional proof to show that the domain of definition on which we have such an integral curve is cannot be bounded from above and below. And this is completely works as in the finite dimensional setting. However, the only thing which is new now in this year is um, since we don't have ODE solution theory uh, in general, because we are in this very general setting, we always have to play back our existence and uniqueness of the of the of these integral curves to the uh, differential equation for which we have existence and uniqueness. So we always have to play this back to a lead type differential equation because for regular lead groups we know that there is a unique uh, solution for those, right? And uh, okay, so let me. Uh, Let's see how this goes. So if you know the finite dimension proof, then uh, this will be very familiar, apart from that we always have to play this back to the type differential equations. Okay, so first of all, we can define the curve e tau x of the reals with values in the lead group, uh, sorry, in the lead algebra, and we take the constant curve sending t to x of 1. So we start with a left invariant vector field x, right? So this is the x, and uh, this is uniquely defined by this. And obviously, this is a smooth curve because it's constant. Okay, great. So we can solve um, differential equations. However, at least in the regularity condition, our curves were different. So um, what I will have to do frequently. I will identify this curve e of x, which is actually defined on all of the reals because it's constant, so it's no problem to do this. So there's, of course, the restricted version, where I restrict the e of x to the co uh, closed interval from 0 to 1. However, I will not denote this in the, um, uh, in the notation, right? So we will, we will basically sweep this restriction under the rug. The point is, why do we want to restrict that all? is because um, the evolution equation I can solve is the following. Um, I can basically uh, obtain the solution gamma from 0 to 1, taking values in the lead group, so this is regularity, um, to the equation um, or to the D type equation, but should start at the identity element and the derivatives of this guy. Every point you see here is given by E that he uh, dot, uh, uh, I'm sorry, gamma T dot theta of T. Well, and if we just look at this, this is T lambda gamma of T applies X. And now, using that uh, x is a uh, left invariant vector field, if you multiply with the derivative, uh, if you apply the derivative of the left multiplication or something, we see that the meaning of this is this same x of gamma. So we have a solution of our flow equation now on all of this from 0 to 1. Um, okay, and uh, obviously. Uh, what, uh, what we will show now is that uh, this solution uh, of the equation can actually be extended to all of the reals, right? Uh, so on the nose, the differential equation, the type differential equation, only gives us a unique solution on uh, from zero to one, and we want to extend it to the uh, everything. Um, actually, so. Um, there is a meta theorem which is only slightly more complicated to prove than what we what we are going to do now. So um, I defined my um, 
the curve of eta and, all, and the solution of the eta equation only on the uh, closed and then, uh, therefore compacted uh, from zero to one. You can actually show that whenever you can solve the eta equation on any closed interval uh, from uh, let's say zero to one or from a to b, whatever way is not to be, then uh, uh, it's automatic, so you can always extend the solution to a solution on all of the reals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so, and the proof will be somewhat similar to what we are doing now. It's slightly less complicated because we are uh, solving here for a constant curve, right? So, uh, so there are less variables running around we have to take care of, but in principle, uh, a little bit more of an advanced version of the argument I'm going to present to you works for, uh, for an arbitrary solution to this B-type differential equation. Uh, and if you're interested in that, there is on one hand, again, the book by Trigger and Michel, which uh, has sort of all of these proofs in there, also that the solution is unique. And if you prefer not looking at the book because it's very long, uh, there is a beautiful article from the 90s, I think 1997, also by Krigler Bichon, which slightly predates the book and was called Regular Infinite Dimensional e Groups. And there, the purpose of, the, of this article is to establish all of these results. And uh, actually, this article is the later book chapter or is somewhat related. Okay. Um, and it's also not important that they use a different kind of calculus. So they are using convenient calculus and uh, Bastiani calculus. When it comes to the extension of the of solutions and so forth, the, uh, the same argument works in convenient and in Bastiani calculus. The question is, of course, uh, you, will, will you get the solution in the first place, which might be easy. Okay, anyway, let's do uh, step one, which is um, extension to an interval where zero is contained in the interior of the interval. So we, let's be modest and let's extend first to this. And um, so I'm writing down to you now what the extension should be. And um, okay. Um, okay. So I need to choose this. Since G is Also, right. This was what we had in this one remark. Right regularity means I can solve the following differential equation uniquely. Gamma let me put an R here. Gamma R of zero is the NSP elements. Gamma R plus uh, e is, is now eta of t. Sorry, that's yeah, so now I put the point here. Um, and as gamma r still, where the meaning of this guy here is to use the right multiplication of gamma r of t size. So we are using right multiplication. Okay, and this is the strict when you can do always left evolution, you can also do right evolution. Um, okay, so this is right regular. So um, uh, let's come on R from zero to one G D the solution. Okay, and uh, we again expect this implementation to this initial value problem for the same data. Right. So we're taking the right evolution now. Okay. Um, okay. And then we define gamma x of t. So we say it's gamma r inverse. With inverse, I mean that the point wise inverse in the Lie group. Right? So this is, you take the curve gamma r of t. You evaluate that you get a point in the Lie group. I can invert this using the Lie group conversion. So this is still a smooth mapping, and I set this for all points t from minus one to zero. Ah, sorry. Then I was forgetting the minus in here. Aha. 
So there's a story going on, inversion at minus, right? And then I take gamma of t for t in zero one. Let's note two things. First, this is a continuous curve uh, because if I get a gamma in zero, I get the identity element. The gamma r in, uh, in, in zero is also the identity element. If I draw this, uh, the sky, it's, uh, it's also uh, the identity element. So this actually makes sense and gives us a continuous curve. But we don't want a continuous curve, we want a smooth curve. Right, so this should be smooth, and the, the point will be to see that this formula actually gives us a smooth curve on this interval from uh, minus one to one. Right, so continuous is not good enough, we want smooth. Um, okay. Um, oh, well, we don't only want smooth, I mean, the second thing we want is that if we derivate that, we uh, see that it satisfies the flow equation. We want that uh, it actually, if I derivate this uh, thing at every point, it satisfies this identity, so it's actually a flow curve. Okay, let's see whether this is true. So just leave a comment, if you know the finite dimension of proof, in finite dimensions, this, is, this step doesn't exist. Why? Because in finite dimensions, you solve the flow, uh, you get a solution to this uh, to this flow of the vector field equation, which lives on a small open interval around zero. And my main problem is here that I have solved the differential equation on a closed interval where uh, some of the the initial point is the left part of this. And a priori, I mean, since differential equations in all infinite dimensional space might be super bad. I mean, if that was a Banach space, I knew that I could extend this at least slightly to the left of zero. So there would be a solution. But if I'm in a very general space, who knows what happens if I try this? So this might explode immediately after if you go to the left. And uh, this is why we need this extra step here. I mean, sort of, this formula looks really weird. Um, how do you come up with such an idea? There's actually, when you look into this beautiful article by Michor and the Kriegel and Michor on regular loops, there are lots of identities which connect the left evolution to the right evolution. And if you know these identities, you just have to look at this and you can cheat and guess which one is the right way to, uh, to pick uh, this, this first part here. Right? So if you know the, what, uh, what you want, you can cheat a little if you know the identities. And of course, uh, as Klaus said, he likes to uh, show everything without the scaffolding. It now looks like I'm brilliant and this just fell from the sky. Uh, but this was sort of the result of me thinking a little bit about this equation for, let's say, half an hour or something, until I remember how to this. Once you have it, it's great. Well, anyway. Let's prove on one hand, I mean, obviously, apart from this one point uh, where we have stitched these things together, it's clear that everything is smooth, right? But we need to go to the one point and see that actually everything is fine there and uh, see what's going on. Okay, so let's just compute the derivative of this gamma r inverse of minus t. And here comes an end of this exercise where we have, to, uh, so I will write this now as yota t, so the inversion in the Lie group, applied to gamma r of minus t. And we had some exercise where we computed the tangent map of this inversion, right? And this is sort of the reason why I asked you to do this, because we really want this now. So, um, okay, so the result of this, uh, uh, plugging in the tangent map of the inversion is we have minus t of lambda gamma r inverse of t, t rho gamma r minus t, uh, sorry, I was forgetting the inverse here, uh, 
uh, and then I apply this to gamma dot r of minus t. And uh, let's see. Yes, so this is, sorry, let's, let's write that. It's, it's clear that I haven't taken the derivative here of this guy because then this minus here is coming from the tangent map of the inversion. It's not coming from me differentiating with the chain rule, whatever's going on in here. If we are differentiating that, we get another minus outside, which will eat away this one here, right? So let's have a look. Uh, now I'm going to differentiate that. Fortunately, we know what the differential of the, of the gamma is, right? It's uh, just this guy, or in other words, this one. And uh, the only thing which happens if you put a minus in here, so this minus will be right, so t lambda gamma r minus t, t rho gamma r minus uh, uh, inverse of, uh, sorry, here, all the things should have a minus sign, right? So it makes sense. Um, okay, and now let's plug this in. So now this is the right evolution of this curve. So we get a T rho gamma R at minus T. Aha, uh -huh. very advantageous. So these two things cancel each other. This is already nice. Formula gets better. And then we have, um, we have what? We have, um, yes, or did I do this thing uh, as of x at 1. Right? So this was a value of my left invariant field here. Yeah. Okay, so let's, so this stuff goes away, and then we only have this here, okay, and now I have T lambda, gamma inverse R minus T, applied to this, and this is a left invariant field, therefore I can take this in. This is X of gamma inverse R at minus T. Oof. Okay, great. Why well, is this interesting? Well, we see what is happening if we let T go towards zero. Well, this is approaching the right. Uh, so we basically, I mean, we have that if we differentiate that one, uh, so the limit of uh, is uh, the identity element. So we see that this is exactly giving us the same here as um, this is x1 and this is of course the same as shows us that the derivatives fit together at the boundary point and we actually get a smooth extension which in addition satisfies the flow equation for the vector field right so because we needed to have that uh, the curve which i put together here satisfies the flow equation on this part the flow equation is clear on this part the flow equation was not clear unfortunately but this calculation sort of shows that points. okay so therefore the gamma X is smooth on uh, minus one one and it satisfies the flow. Oh, so the equation, let me put the equation here. Gamma dot, gamma x dot, x 
gamma s for all of the team in, uh, in our little. Okay, so this was actually the uh, sort of most time consuming step, and now I could say everything works now as in the finite dimensional case. But since I assume that people have not seen or might have forgotten what the proof is in the finite dimensional case, that's the second step. Uh, so the, the, all of the hassle was basically to extend uh, this curve to an open, uh, to an interval which contains the initial value in its uh, interior, because now comes the classical extension argument that actually the, if you can solve this flow equation on the interval from minus one to one then you can extend this to a solution on all of the reals and we show in the first step that uh, we can extend the solution to every positive time and then uh, because this is a symmetric argument when we can do it to every positive time of course we can also use a similar argument to do it for every negative time so the solution is never uh, it's not bounded from above and uh, by just picking sort of uh, some negative time to start you also see that the solution interval is not bounded from below but we only need the step bounded from above because the bounded from below step would be the same Right. Um, so let's see. That. Okay. Step two. Um, so can I extend this to all of the wheels? And actually, we only showed that it's not bounded, but that, they, that it can be extended for all the positive reasons. So, first of all, let's pick the time not between 0 and 1, and let's build an extension. Um, so, let's define the curve gamma t naught as something living on minus 1 plus t naught, uh, 1 plus t naught. Going to G, which sends T to gamma of T naught times, sorry, uh, gamma X, this should be gamma X of uh, T minus T naught. And this is now the classical one. I basically, I'm more or less shifted uh, this, whole, uh, this whole affair. So when I step in T naught into this. Um, into this uh, uh, into this guy, what we get is uh, the identity. So at so this new curve gamma of t naught at t naught is gamma x of naught. So we have one point where the integral curves are the same. Now we will show that also this one is an integral curve, and then by uniqueness of the solution. Um, we, need, uh, we know that on their common domain of definition, these two things need to be the same. I mean, the uniqueness of solution in our reading is the uniqueness of the V-type uh, equation solution, right? We are, I mean, usually you would just get this for free, but here we have to invoke the, the V-type uniqueness. Uh, okay, so let's see. What is gamma T naught not at the point T naught? E lambda gamma x t naught, uh, and then we have to derivate this other part here, t minus t naught. Since we have t naught plus t, we have gamma x t. E. I'm ah, sorry, well, we have the derivative of this guy, and this is t lambda gamma t naught. Um, x variates gamma x t. Now we can put this in here because the vector field is left invariant. This operator was in here. So we have gamma t naught multiplied from the left with this one. Uh, so we get x at gamma 
is not Yes, x missing gamma x of t naught, and then we have times gamma x of t, but the gamma x of t is of course secretly a gamma x of t plus t naught minus t naught. So what we see here, what the result of this, this is gamma t naught at the point t naught plus t. Okay, so this is an integral curve of this of this x here, and uh, therefore, I mean, we can do this basically for every t in the domain of definition of this curve gamma t naught, and then uh, thus we see uh, on the intersection of this interval with the interval from minus one to one, this is a solution to the d-type equation. Because actually, I mean, what we are always using here in the, the Barnard space setting, or where you have good super solution theory, would be just enough to say this is an integral curve. Integral curves are unique. Well, something like broken in P3, so I'm, I'm basically, uh, basically repeating, uh, repeating myself. Here we have the uniqueness not because of OBE solution theory, but because of regularity. Because we say this, or we see that this flow equation is actually a lead type equation. Okay. Great. Um, so we have that. Um, so uniqueness of the solution shows that gamma to not coincides on one minus one plus T naught. Uh, one plus T naught intersected with minus one one with um, gamma x, and uh, we can therefore smoothly extend. And x to well, the interval minus one to one plus two naught. And note also that we are preserving uh, the property that uh, on this interval, this flow equation has only one solution. Right? So we are uh, we are not losing this property. We can do it again and again and again. And this shows, I mean, basically by nudging this increment for increment. Uh, Advancing this, this shows that there cannot be an upper bound for the existence of the uniqueness and the existence of this solution, and therefore this gamma of x can be defined as the unique solution to the flow equation on all of uh, well, from minus one to plus infinity. Right? And to do the same for the for the lower bound, well, then we just pick the t naught, which is strictly smaller than zero and uh, but bigger than minus one, and do the same uh, thing. And uh, well, you'll find that it works exactly the same. So, uh, this argument shows that uh, we can extend the solution in a unique way to all of the reads. Right? And this is completely classic, right? So, the only thing that is just the justification is a little bit different because we have to appeal to a differential equation when you have a unique solution. Okay, so. I'm not writing any more of this. Um, good. Now we know that left invariant vector fields are complete. We can extend them for all time. And this allows us to define the Lebu exponential, which you have heard about several times today. And let's see how this goes. So actually, if you have never seen the Lebu exponential, um, we saw yesterday that uh, one of the first examples for Lie groups are matrix Lie groups, right? So you take matrices and um, you um, 
look at the, um, well, the inversion matrices of the group that you have D group. And uh, for matrices, one learns in uh, one of the calculus classes that there is a so called matrix exponential function. You take the exponential series, plug in matrices, see that this always converges and uh, turns out an invertible matrix. And uh, if you want, you can think of the uh, exponential map of the lead group as a generalization of the matrix exponential function. So this is not the exception in the theoretic terms of the matrix exponential. Okay, so let me just define it. And as we've discussed, it's not really a um, restriction, right? Because all of the you know which are nice are regular. Um, then we define Mapping, so this is X, just like the usual exponential from the Lie algebra, taking values in the group. If you take the V and send this to uh, gamma V in one, where gamma V is the unique. Of the equation gamma v dot equals uh, t lambda gamma v t uh, applies to v gamma v of zero. Yeah, that's it. So we have a D type equation. And as we've as we've just learned, this is the flow equation of the left invariant vector field generated by this one, right? And uh, since we can extend the, the solution to this um, you know, to all of R, I mean, we could uh, we could sort of just leverage that. Uh, I mean, we wouldn't have needed the previous proof uh, because it's not important that uh, the solution exists in all of R. We we could do with the solution which just exists from zero to one. However, the reason why one wants this is the following. Uh, so this is often also done in finite dimensional um, theory. Uh, is, uh, there's the concept of the so-called one parameter group. So what you can prove a little bit more work. What is good? Hmm? What is good? The meaning is coming from the whole group. What was the first uh, meaning exponential map or mean group exponential map? Historically. The idea is the same, I guess. It's a good question. I mean, I don't know what this is. I mean, at least here, I don't know this with the concept of human more. I don't know. Uh, no, you don't know. I just do. No, I, unfortunately, I don't know. So I should refresh oh, my knowledge about history here. Yeah. So let's. Let me, before I call it, uh, explain a little bit more. Okay, before I come to this, let me just explain one thing which you can prove. Um, when we are, if you are going to prove this is an exercise. So if you have, so this exponential function has some nice properties. If you have the element t plus s times z, if you exponentiate that, it turns out that, I mean, if this 
was a uh, the usual exponential function if we have a product uh, okay um, sorry if we have a sum in the argument of the of the experiment we expect this to become a product this is true actually i mean you might wonder why didn't he write something like v plus w for two elements and the reason is that we're in a non commutative setting and this nice formula that sums get maps to products is only true for commuting elements. You can think of this when you are, when you think about the matrix exponential, you already you, you, see, you know that if you have two non-commuting matrices, you cannot sort the matrix and uh, the exponential series together. Okay, and so basically uh, this exponential function gives rise to um, a curve. Uh, let's not call all the curves gamma. Um, what's your favorite name for for one parameter subgroup? Theta. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. hmm? Okay. Let's let's take a U. So this gives rise to nothing R. Okay. So and what you do is then T. So the U depends now on an x and uh, to send this to x of um, t x, right? So this is just a straight line in the D algebra, you exponentiate it, you get some sort of curve which runs around in the, in the linear group. And uh, this has now a nice property that we have this to get x. U, uh, S, S. So this becomes a group homomorphism from the additive group of the reals into the new group. And this is called the one, the one parameter subgroup. Right? So you always get a subgroup because uh, you get this actually, this, uh, uh, so we see that it doesn't uh, uh, play a role in which, uh, in which way we multiply these two things together to the elements into the commute. So this is the one parameter subgroup, and we work that out for the uh, one of the exercises. Not too hard to see. Um, so the exponential mapping generates all these one parameter subgroups. Uh, actually, there I'm quoting another result which I haven't proved yet. But uh, okay, let me just give you one remark. We have defined this x here from the Lie algebra, mapping the Lie to the solution of this differential equation. Since we have regularity. We fortunately know already that this is a smooth mapping because um, okay, so this is the March line. So the mapping C, which takes a vector in the new algebra and maps it into the smooth functions from 0 to 1 with values in the new algebra. And, uh, so it takes it to the constant function, which only takes this one. This is continuous linear. Yes. Because continuous is linear. So we actually, have, for continuity, we basically have to check um, that, the, uh, that the pre image of uh, uh, things in the compact open C infinity topology are open here. But uh, this is a somewhat easy exercise. We discussed this actually. Uh, I discussed it with one person in the, uh, in the, in the problem session without going through the proof. But uh, it's not too hard to see this right when you're working with the one that goes in the topology. Um, and the description here. So this is smooth. And then um, we see that if we want to write x of b, this is the same thing as taking. C of E. So we associate the curve which is smooth and constant equal to V. And then we apply it with the small apple. This mapping is smooth by regularity. This is a smooth mapping. So therefore, the equal exponential is a smooth mapping. And indeed, we can think of the Lie group exponential, I mean, this is basically what this equation is saying, as a restriction of the small evolve map to, uh, to very simple curves, namely the 
curves which are constant, right? And in a, in a way, uh, I mean, usually people tend to view this the other way around because you usually uh, learn first about this exponential map, and uh, then you think about the small involvement as a generalization of the leak group exponential, not the other way around, where you say the uh, you specialize the effort to the x. But uh, at least for the infinite dimensional groups, it's convenient to think in this way about this because this makes clear why the x map here is smooth. I mean, you can, the classical proof also works if you want, right? Um, to a certain extent. Um, however, uh, it's now pleasant to see that this is also a consequence of regularity. And it gives us all these one parameter groups. And now we're coming to Hans Mutikos, uh, who said this morning that uh, he wants to use the exponential function as a chart. So one more thing which you uh, can prove um, in a Banach space setting, I guess. Um, so one can prove that if I take the derivative of the exponential function at zero, that I get here the identity map. So it turns out that uh, uh, so x of zero. This is the curve send. Uh, so this is the constant curve sending everything to zero, right? From the first of small evolution. And we want to solve that. Uh, we want to solve the differential equation. We want a curve starting at the identity whose derivative is vanishing everywhere. Okay, and if the derivative is vanishing, we are luckily in a, in a situation where vanishing of the derivative means curve is constant, right? So this is um, uh, so this is always equal to the unit in the. So what this means is um, we have a mapping which maps uh, zero to one, and whose Derivative at the point zero is regular, right? So uh, regular meaning um, you know, uh, it was finite dimensional, so the derivative is invertible, right? Uh, so the derivative is, is, not, is a nice invertible isomorphism of linear spaces, right? And if you are in a situation where you have an inverse function theorem, for example, on a bar, then this means. That um, if you have an inverse function, this, uh, these conditions means uh, that the exponential is inducing a local diffeomorphism. So we find an open neighborhood of zero, which gets mapped diffeomorphically to an open neighborhood of one. And this is true for all Banach Lie groups, this is true for all finite dimensional Lie groups, um, because of the inverse function theorem. Right? And uh, so this is what, uh, when we discuss this today, what people usually call exponential coordinates for the leading around the unit. Because then you use the exponential function as a, uh, as a chart for your lead group, or actually you should say it as a parameterization. Unfortunately, at least if you read the appendix of the lecture notes, if you go beyond bar spaces, you don't have an inverse function theorem. So this property, is usually not good enough to show that the exponential map gives you a, a local diffeomorphism around the identity. And um, so I will, I will not prove that this fails because the usual proofs are perhaps not super involved, but we have to invest a little bit. Uh, I mean, what do I mean? I mean I'm, I'm just telling you that there are examples where the exponential map fails miserably to be uh, a local diffeomorphism around uh, zero. And the prime example, which we are touching now all the time as an example, but where we leave a lot of details in the realm of literature, is the diffeomorphism. So it turns out that the diffeomorphism group is one of the offenders where uh, so you can write down exponential map for the diffeomorphism groups L with M, M compact manifold going to be M 
So we know since this morning that these are vector fields in M. And if you do the calculations, and there's something to prove, so this is not for free. Uh, but if you do the calculations, you see the mapping, so it takes vector fields and sends this to the map, which computes the flow of the vector field and evaluates the flow in time one. So this is a diffeomorphism. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, if you haven't seen it in finite dimensional uh, theory, you can prove that uh, there, are, there are flows of vector fields. And, uh, so the flow map is something which depends on the vector field. It eats a spatial component and a time component. Since on a compact manifold, every vector field on a compact manifold is complete, so you can extend the integral curves to all time. So therefore, it makes sense if you have an integral curve starting at some point in the manifold, you can always follow the flow curve up to time one. And what you can prove is that this flow map, if you're not evaluating in the, uh, in the spatial component, you get a diffeomorphism of the, uh, of, the, of the manifold. And it turns out that this mapping here is the exponential function of uh, the diffeomorphism, the flow, to, uh, the flow to time one map. Okay, um, so it turns out that if I look at a very nice little manifold, namely I take the unit circle and look at the different models, this is a one dimensional manifold, uh, one can show, uh, so, um, for this manifold, or for this Lie group, uh, the uh, Exponential map not surjective onto any neighborhood of the identity elements, the identity elements, the identity elements. Right? So uh, it's not only a problem that you cannot invert this mapping in, in some sense. There are always elements which are arbitrarily near to this one, which you cannot uh, hit as, an, as something which you have exponentiated from the Lie algebra. And I think the strongest results here are due to Jan Stravowski, who uh, um, proved that you can actually, uh, here is the identity element, so he proves that there is some uh, that there is a smooth curve, which I mean, obviously I cannot draw the diffeomorphism with this infinite dimension. But there is a smooth smooth curve of diffeomorphisms running through the identity, which intersects the image of the exponential uh, mapping only at the identity and at no other point. And so, in a very strong sense, the exponential is non-surjective uh, in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, so the theorem is apparently like this. Uh, there is, a, so Gorowski proves that there's, I think, I'm not sure, I think even an uncountable, okay, so this is getting stronger by, the, by every time I'm telling it. <laughs> but this is, I think there is an uncountable family of smooth curves in the Lie group, in div S1, which, uh, uh, where these curves um, run, uh, or we have the smooth curve, uh, running around in the Lie group, and it intersects the image of the exponential only in the identity, so in the unit of the Lie group. And the unit is always in the image of the, uh, of the exponential, as we've seen over there, but uh, sort of there are, in a certain sense, infinitely many directions by which you can approach the unit and, and not and avoid the exponential, except at one point where you have no choice but to run through the image of the exponential. So, in a very strong sense, these groups have bad exponential functions. And this is what one should always expect if one has a Lie group beyond um, the Banach space setting, that the exponential functions, before one knows anything about the exponential, one should better assume that the exponential is bad. So, can I interrupt you? Sure. So, in the morning, I, I had a misconception, of course. I, 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 I couldn't understand the argument because there is a theorem saying that if you have a mapping from a matrix Lie algebra to a matrix Lie group, which has these two properties, uh, that the tangent is identity and then the mapping sends 0 to 1, 
and it is analytic, analytic okay. mapping, then, then uh, the unique solution is exponential mapping. Yes. So I thought, I, I, I wrongly thought that uh, in general, the, the only solution to this kind of problem is uh, exponential mapping, which is completely wrong, of course. So, so what, what is breaking down in general? Is it analytics? Is it yeah, this uh, coordinate map or is it a well, I mean, matrix uh, thing? Or what, what is it? Uh, so on one hand, because you have, you have coordinates maps doing exactly this, but it was not exponential map, it was something else. Yes, I mean, sort of, I mean, you can uh, define analyticity for um, uh, for these, uh, for, uh, we can concept, uh, we can define the concept of an analytic mapping in, say, Bastiani calculus or in Cognini calculus, depending on what your favorite kind of uh, calculus is, if you ask me Bastiani. Uh, we haven't talked about analytic mappings uh, because all we are doing here is, is basically based on smooth mappings and analytic case to do. Um, what is breaking down in finite dimensional Lie theory, you always, when you look at this local model of the addition as we did today, if you do a uh, if you do the Taylor series expansion of, of this, you, uh, you end up, uh, sorry, that's not entirely correct. So, the low, uh, if you want to represent your uh, your multiplication in local coordinates for a finite dimension, it's always possible to do this using the so-called baker kemper hausdorff series. Mm -hmm. Don't feel bad if you don't know what baker kemper hausdorff series is. It's a horrible series which incorporates sort of iterated. It's just inverse method expansion. This is essentially what we're doing this morning. It's just yes. expansion. Yeah. You did a local, uh, you did a local uh, product, uh, yeah. and if you have this uh, expansion for, for doing that, you develop it this case. Yes. Yeah. And so, this Baker Camper Hausdorff series for a finite dimension group always converges in, a sum, in some small neighborhood of the uh, zero. In infinite dimension, even if you have an analytic G group, this is not true anymore in general. Uh, okay, perhaps with the analytic part, I'm, I need to check again, but. Uh, so there is there's a class of Lie groups for which this is. I mean, on Barnard Lie groups, everything is fine because there you still have this uh, the BCH series and you have local convergence of the series around zero. Um, beyond Barnard spaces, not without any any arguments. So there is actually a class of Lie groups which is called uh, which are called BCH Lie groups because uh, for Baker and Hausdorff and baked into the definition of a BCH Lie group is. The Lie group is analytic and the vector from the Hausdorff series converges. Uh, we haven't talked about analyticity, and uh, I will not uh, do sort of BCH analysis here. Uh, this, these Baker Campbell Hausdorff Lie groups are in a certain way, uh, I mean, this class exists basically because there are Lie groups which are modeled on spaces which are not Barnack spaces, which still have this convergence of BCH series. Is it the same as Milner called analytical? In his uh, this uh, lectures, it seems to me that he called it that might that might be yes. I mean, I mean, uh, yeah, might might be. Um, so the the whole point, I mean, what you can think about BCH Lie groups are is that they are sort of almost like Barnard Lie groups without being Barnard Lie groups because they're not modeled on a on a Barnard space. So uh, for these Baker Kappel Hausdorff D groups, you have always have that the exponential is a local uh, diffeomorphism. And um, so, um, I mean, if you want, you can read this, uh, this observation that this S1, uh, that the exponential map is bad. You can already, already read this as well, this D group is not a BCH D group. So the Baker Kappel Hausdorff series will be, uh, will be bad on this one. Okay. I apologize if you have no idea what, what I'm talking about. Uh, we have not defined the big and also series. Okay, so um, let me just introduce another term. So in general, beyond Barnack spaces, the exponential map is bad. And we are not doing, I mean, you can find this, um, uh, you can find uh, an example of this in almost every paper. On uh, introductory to infinite dimension e groups, but since I considered a little bit whether I want to give the example, but uh, then I found that we have to do too many details, which would lead us a little bit far. So, uh, in the lecture notes, you find again a reference to um, the paper where this is actually done in detail. However, one would, of course, have uh, so there is a name 
for a situation when the Lie group exponential is not bad. So on Banach Lie groups, uh, it's never bad. And um, so the name for this is um, uh, 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 If exponential function alpha between this local is the one from a zero neighborhood. Algebra to uh, uh, one neighborhood. I mean, this is just the name for the situation. The D group exponential is good, and as we have seen, uh, or whatever that came, if we are in a Banach space setting because of uh, the inverse function theorem, every Banach D group is automatically locally exponential. And there are examples, actually, there are in the last time we've seen cropping up examples of infinite dimensional Lie groups which are not modeled on Banach spaces where uh, the Lie group exponential is good. So, where, where you actually can use, if you want, you could use this as coordinates. However, so um, this class of locally exponential Lie groups has many nice properties. Um, we are almost at uh, we are almost at the, the closing of the, of the chapter. I won't go into this uh, into the nice properties. So there's for these locally exponentially groups. There's something. Let me just give you a, some flavor of uh, what you can prove for these locally exponentially groups. And uh, so for a proof of this fact, there's this beautiful survey paper by Carl Hammer-Mee, which is called "Towards the Theory of Locally Convex Lie Groups." And uh, so, what you can prove is the so called automatic smoothness theorem. And this goes as follows that G and H be locally exponential equals. And um, F on E H um, continuous group Well, what we expect when we explain something called the automatic smoothness the theorem, then the same thing is then F smooth, or in other words, the F is. Exactly. And the reason is you take the proof from the dimensional thing and it works because we've required the exponential split. Yeah, so um, yes. Let me um, okay. I mean, uh, we can do this since I was uh, and done with now this chapter on regularity. So let me let me give you. Um, is there a subgroup here? Yes, for local exponential, there is a no subgroup here. I mean, uh, it's not. It's still not automatic. So not uh, every uh, closed subgroup is uh, is a uh, new subgroup. I mean. We have yesterday seen a Hilbert space, which is a Hilbert Lie group, and therefore it's locally exponential. And uh, so there cannot be an automatic, I mean, the statement from finite dimensions cannot be automatically true. But uh, if you look into this, uh, into this article by Karl Hammer, so you will find uh, uh, some conditions on the Lie algebra or something which should then be the Lie algebra of the closed subgroup, which you can check often relatively easily. And uh, sorry, 
feeling the complement of subspace. Um, I think they try not to be complete. Well, I don't think so. No, on second spot, no. But uh, it's been it's been a while since I read Kahneman, so so let's uh, <laughs> we put it like this. So I'm chicken out a little bit. Uh, okay, now let, let me produce uh, an example. Mm -hmm. Just want to represent this in the easiest way. So this is not in a lecture now. Let's see. Well, I can do something relatively simple. So I mean, I can give you an example. Uh, for example, the Butcher group from the American analysis is locally exponential. Actually, it's much stronger. It's exponential, meaning that the exponential map is global if you want. Yes. Um, see. I mean, typically, ah, yes, okay, I can put it like this. Unit groups of CIAs, they are typically, uh, if they are regular, they, uh, the unit group is locally exponential. Yes. Because of uh, the following thing, which, which works then. Okay. Yes. Okay. This this is an easy this is an easy example because I don't have to explain to you how to set up the picture book, for example. Um, let me let me just motivate this. I mean, and this is again why unit groups of CIAs are uh, like infinite dimensional matrix D groups. Right? For matrix D groups, we also have uh, the nice exponential function. So, example, uh, we have uh, A, uh, uh, B, B, C, A, uh, plus this condition such as Okay. Um, and so, what you do now, um, an exercise is so we know that the unit group is the induced multiplication. This is an infinite dimensional E group. What is the V algebra associated with it? It's the whole space with the commutator bracket. And now, what happens if you're running through? Uh, the calculation: What is the group? Uh, what is the what is the group exponential? So we want to define x. Let me write an x a here. That's an x a times. So this is going. This is to be a map from a to um, the unit group. And it turns out what you can do with this is. Um, you can take A and plug this into the usual uh, exponential series. And now I have to take here, let me mark this as a bullet. So this is A times A times A times A, where this bullet stands for you use the algebra multiplication. And what you can show is that there is a small neighborhood around the around the identity element in this group where you can invert this and the inverse is given by the uh, you take the formal logarithm series which I always forget how to write this down and uh, this gives you an inverse to this exponential series I mean formally a series it's clear what you just have to show is that this thing converges in uh, on a small neighborhood so this actually gives you an analytic uh, an analytic exponential and logarithm for, for this thing. So CIAs are examples of locally exponential things. Uh, now, of course, it would be nice to write down you know, just a, a nice CIA, which is not a Barnard, <laughs> uh, Barnard um, uh, algebra to, to see an explicit example. Um, I could write down some, but then I'm, uh, I have to explain <laughs> why this is a CIA and so forth. So, um, Okay, yeah. you can define this 
meaning of the expansion matrix is changed. Yes. Since you have both operations. Yeah. And you have to you have to work a little bit. Uh, I mean, uh, so you prove that this is true by uh, by inversion of um, uh, by, by version of functional calculus for CIAs. So this is actually, I mean, the, that um, that uh, there is a neighborhood in which you can invert this uh, this operation. So this is this actually uses functional calculus. Um, it goes back to what I think. There's this huge book on uh, locally convex algebras by Wellberg uh, from. 70s, I think, or something, and this is sort of the foundation for everything of this. And the leaf theory of these human groups is, I think, a little bit newer, so end of the 90s, beginning of 2000, something like that, when people have studied these things as human groups. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Can we find some more examples of uh, the diffeomorphism group? Is an example of something which is bad. Uh, Barnard algebra, CIAs, we have this. Um, okay, I don't think I want to define the butcher group because I think we don't. Uh, so, if everybody knows what of algebra is, we could do that. But uh, since I don't want to introduce this, so there's, there's this group which pops up in numerical analysis. It happens to be an infinite dimensional Lie group, and uh, there uh, actually you can identify this butcher group with the closed subgroup of the unit group of a suitable CIA. And then, uh, I mean, this is not how you prove usually that the uh, group has a nice Lie group structure, but it inherits basically everything from this uh, ambient uh, CIA unit group. Of course, then if you want to take this route, you have to prove again that this closed subgroup is actually a Lie subgroup. You can do this, but it's worked since, uh, as I said, for locally exponential things, the situation is a little better than usual. Uh, because you have some criteria to figure out when closed subgroups are Lie subgroups. However, it's still not for free, so there are some, there are some things you have to check. Okay. Um, and basically, this concludes this chapter on regular Lie groups. What we have seen today is basically we, have, uh, we went from the Lie algebra on to uh, some nice properties, which apparently all infinite dimensional Lie groups on sufficiently nice spaces satisfy some regularity. This allows us to define the Lie group exponential. And um, ah. uh -huh. so what we will be doing in the next lecture, but this is for tomorrow, is the following. Let me, let me just give you a short sneak peek and then I give you another example of a locally exponential one. So let's take the Lie group. This is, a, this is a nice last uh, thing to do. Um, let's assume we have a group. When we were discussing these manifolds of mappings, I was saying, well, uh, we have this Stacy Roberts lemma, which allows to uh, lift the submersion property to the infinite dimensional manifolds of mappings. And I was saying, well, uh, we will see this uh, principle again over the next lectures, and now is the time when we will see it again. So we have this Lie group structure, we have a differentiable group here. Whenever you have that, uh, you can form the following thing. You can take a compact manifold, look at all the smooth functions from K with values in the group G. And then, well, on one hand, let's assume, uh, let's assume for a moment we have a local addition or something like this, we get a nice manifold structure on this infinite dimension. Okay, and we can multiply two functions, f and g, in here, just by the pointwise multiplication, exactly like we do pointwise addition for vector value functions, right? And this gives us a group structure by pointwise multiplication, pointwise inversion here. And uh, the group we get in this manner is often called a current group. Uh, current like uh, like flow or something like this, and this uh, is uh, studied in physics a lot. So loop groups are not possible. Yes, loop groups are a special case. So a loop group is usually this one. So we take L G and we define it as the smooth function from as one with values in G. So this is just a specialization of the, uh, the current. We look at both cases tomorrow. 
The point is, these are some very well behaved uh, examples of infinite dimensional groups. I mean, usually you start with a finite dimensional one and then build this infinite dimensional uh, guy here. Um, so actually, it turns out that if you restrict your choice of uh, compact manifold here to the circle, and then think of these, um, the reason why this is called loop group is evident, basically because elements in the loop group look like a loop in the, uh, in the group. Um, and um, okay, should say some people like to define their loop groups using only continuous functions. You can also do that if you want, but uh, we, only, I mean, we have all the tools for smooth functions here, right? So we, we're not going to continue to that. Okay, so one of the things, so here we have the group wise. Um, with, uh, with the element-wise uh, multiplication and so forth, so we get a group structure. The, what we'll see tomorrow is, with the usual, uh, uh, or there will be a nice construction, which allows us to turn these things, or these function spaces, with the compact open C infinity topology into infinite dimensional new groups, right? So, um, we will turn, we will build a canonical manifold structure on this, turning uh, this group, into an infinite dimension E group, and we may, of course, ask what is the Lie algebra of this current E? Any guesses? What, uh, what would you expect if I'm, if I'm asking this? So, here we have this group of smooth mappings with values of the Lie group, we have the pointwise operations. What would one hope one could get to? as the Lie algebra of this current group. Maybe Lie algebra of function. Yes. So, as I said, this is this. And what would we hope what the bracket is for, for this one? I mean, this is only the space identification. Of course, we would also like to know what this is the bracket for this one. Okay, what one uh, what one look for the leap bracket? I mean, basically, I need to define now the leap bracket of two functions. Sorry, say again. Uh, in the sense of bracket of vector fields, or uh, which one? Ah, yes. It's actually, so it, it will turn out, if I evaluate this thing in a point k, it will turn out again to be the point wise bracket. So this would be f of k, g of k, and then I take the new bracket here in this. And this guy is uh, fittingly enough called the current algebra. Well, okay, <laughs> we see where this is coming from. So we have the current group, which is given by uh, point wise multiplication here. Or smooth functions point wise multiplied, and uh, smooth function which was very the algebra with the Lie bracket given by the point wise Lie bracket will turn out to be the Lie algebra associated to the current group. So in a way, what one what this picture should suggest is we can lift a lot of the geometric information from the target Lie group to the current Lie group and the current Lie algebra. And this way, it will actually turn out if your target Lie group here is locally exponential, then also the current group is locally exponential. So this is actually inherited by the current Lie group. So if you start with the finite dimensional Lie group, you always end up in uh, a locally exponential Lie group. And since in general, uh, these Lie groups uh, will not be modeled on Barnard spaces, we have now a, a nice uh, storage of examples of uh, locally exponential Lie groups which are not modeled on Barnard spaces. Uh, so, but however, we'll, we shall do this tomorrow because, sort of, the first step at least in the way I want to do this, I want to prove a very nice result due to, uh, well, due to Bobaki. So, at least you can find it in one of the classical books by Bobaki, which uh, will explain if you have a group which happens to be a manifold. And you know that in some neighborhood of, uh, of your group, uh, you have smooth group operations, then there is a way of extending all of this to a, to a Lie group structure of the whole group. And uh, unfortunately, this would be very technical to keep us. Uh, 
I don't know. I know this only from this. So there's this. Uh, and he was one of the officers with the with Baki, so. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, unfortunately, I looked just from the outset. This uh, Bobaki E groups, chapters one to uh, I don't know nine or whatever the, the highest number there is, and uh, this uh, this is one uh, this is contained in this classical Bobaki book from '68, I think. At least this one specific or whatever. Yeah, so it's um, some very good. So that's. Uh, I don't know who the, who the author of this is. Okay, well, these current D groups and loop groups and so forth, we will, we will see tomorrow, and this will keep us for most of tomorrow to construct the loop groups and to deduce uh, some of these lifting properties where we can sort of deduce uh, geometric properties from the target um, as something which lives on, uh, on the current D group then. And the significance of these current loop groups comes often from physics because they, uh, uh, appear in gauge theories in physics or string theory. Well, theory, yes, yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, but I think then we are done for today. With a small thing you probably didn't 